Back when I was in uni, me and my mates used to play a kind of drinking game called Hunnic Raiders. It all stemmed from a history module we were taking that detailed the rise and fall of the Visigoths. And as much as it's cringe-worthily nerdy to think back on, it was jolly good fun at the time. Basically, if someone put their drink down for more than a few seconds, one of us was liable to grab it, shout Hunnic Raiders, before subsequently downing their drink. I think it'd have caused a spot more bother if we weren't all doing it to each other, and thanks to the student union's subsidized alcohol prices, getting your drink pinched didn't sting as bad as it might do otherwise. So, this started at the beginning of second year, which was also the first year we were on our own flat. We loved that place. Edinburgh had some magnificent old buildings, so we're basically living in a three-story Victorian with a gothic castle facade. We really made it our own too, like it actually felt like home. So despite going home for Christmas that year, we all agreed to travel back to Edinburgh for a big New Year's bash. This one mate of mine, Alex, had been courting since the beginning of term. Nothing too serious apparently, but he saw fit to invite his new belle to the New Year's Eve party. She was gorgeous, sharp as a whip too, a medical student in her third or fourth year. We saw in the new year, had a drink and a boogie, then as the party was winding down, I found myself sitting outside with Alex and Felicity, his prospective girlfriend, sharing a few drinks and puffing away on cheap cigars. They might have been a bit inappropriate, being the third wheel and whatnot, but at one point, Felicity puts an almost untouched drink down for way too long, and I swoop in for the raid. She almost jumps out of her skin as I scream, Hunnic Raiders, before leaning in, snatching up her drink and downing it in one gulp. I wasn't used to the taste of vodka, so even with a healthy serving of lemonade, I remember wincing from the bitter, almost metallic taste. Felicity looked shocked, but Alex looked horrified. I thought he'd be a bit angrier than he was, but no. He seemed so scared that I'd messed his little date up that he honestly looked like he'd seen a ghost. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the last thing I remember. The next thing I remember is waking up with something in my mouth. I tried to spit it out, but it wouldn't budge. And roughly about the same time I realized it was stuck there, I realized it was extending right down to my throat too. I think I was on the verge of a full-on panic attack before a nurse suddenly appeared, and that's how I realized I was in the hospital. I was told that I was stable, and I shouldn't be worried, but that I'd overdosed on drugs at the New Year's party, and had been rushed to the hospital as a result. But here's the thing. The only thing that passed by my lips that night were three cans of Stella, a bottle of Magners, and the vodka and lemonade. And this is over the course of a few hours. I was only a shade past toasty by the time I raided Felicity's vodka, and then after that, nothing. It all started to make some degree of sense when the test finally came back, and the doctors tell me what I actually overdosed on. I was still very much in denial at that point, insisting that I hadn't taken anything and that this was some other, much more frightening medical emergency. But when the doctor told me what was in my system, it all came together in this horrible moment of realization. The substance I overdosed on is called hydroxybutyric acid, and is more commonly known as GHB. For those that have never heard of it, and for a long time, GHB was basically the number one substance used by male predators to render their female prey pliable and eventually unconscious. So, how had it found its way into my drink, you might ask? Like I said, I had four drinks all night. I kept the four cans close to me and drank them quite fast. Then I poured out the bottle of Magners myself with some ice, so I'm pretty sure no one got near that. But then there was the vodka and lemonade, the drink Alex had fetched for his date, Felicity. That was the only drink I'd touched all night whose origin I was unaware of, and it's fair to say its owner was someone Alex was trying to sleep with. Then suddenly, I realized what that look of horror on his face meant. Felicity had arrived later at that party, apparently from a family thing, so she hadn't touched a drop until maybe like 11pm. If you give someone GHB on only a little bit to drink, they suffer the disgustingly desired effects. But giving a fairly intoxicated person a dose of the drug, you can actually bloody kill them. So, 
when I grabbed Felicity's drink, shouted Hunnic Raiders and down it in one, Alex had looked so horrified because he'd known the GHB was in there. And Alex knew the GHB was in there because he's the one that put it in there. At first, when I was asked where I'd been and who might have spiked me, I gave a few deliberately vague answers, telling both my parents and the police, who's swiftly been summoned, that I had racked my brains and let them know if anything came back to me. Then, all of the people who came to the hospital to visit me, one person was suspiciously missing. Care to take a guess as to who that person might be? Ding, ding, ding. That's right. Alex. In the end, I had to call him to get him to come to the hospital, once all the tubes were out of course, and he gave me some crock about having lost track of my messages due to all the Happy New Year messages from family. When he arrived, I basically told him he could either go to the police himself, or I'd tell them what he tried to do. He tried to deny it at first, but I told him the test results had come back, and it was officially GHB in my system. He then gave me a second crock of nonsense about having a problem and needing to get help over it. And being the trusting fool that I am, I believed him. But the absolute scumbag actually attempted to go on the run and get a flight to Amsterdam. Where he was planning on going from there, God only knows, but the Dutch police simply picked up him when he stepped off the plane then sent him right back to the UK in handcuffs and under guard. What followed was one of the trials of my life, no pun intended, because I literally had to testify at Alex's trial for actual bodily harm, among other charges. His date, Felicity, also appeared at some point, but not on the same day as me, so I didn't bump into her. I know it might sound strange, but I think she's the one I really feel sorry for. I know I ended up in hospital, and take it from me, it was a traumatic experience to say the least. But passing out was just about where my suffering ended. Alright, I felt a bit grim for a day or two, but there's nothing compared to what Alex would have subjected his date to had she actually drunk the vodka. I think that was the first big teachable moment with regards to the question of how much do you really know someone? I'd known Alex for almost a year and a half. I thought he was a good guy. Turns out, I was dead wrong about that. And now he's got a criminal record to show for it, as well as being listed on a certain register that means for all intents and purposes, his life as he knew it was gone forever. I'm a cop. In the early hours of New Year's Day, about 10 years ago now, I ended up running silent to a call with additional units in tow. The caller reported hearing footsteps on her second floor while she was in the kitchen below. She lived alone, middle-aged, divorced, no kids, and had no expected company. So obviously this was very concerning to us since she was quite obviously a very vulnerable person. She was outside across the street when we arrived, obviously frightened by what had happened, and as in the process of being calmed by her neighbor. Other units showed up almost as I did and set up a perimeter at the corners of the property. We talk with her, get permission to enter, so we decide we'll announce ourselves and clear the house. Three of us stack up on the front door, announce, then make entry while the other officers are viewing the windows from some distant cover. She was in the midst of making a really late dinner, so the house smelled really good, like the kind of mouth-watering scent that only hits you when you're hungry. Anyway... We clear the ground level and make our way to the stairs when we hear it. Plain as can be, we can all hear footsteps on the wooden second floor. Not the kind of panicky, oh god I'm caught footstep kind of footsteps, running to hide or escape. More like the calm, methodic pace of someone unconcerned by the arrival of the police. We announce ourselves again and no response, except the footsteps just start to sort of fade away. Quietly, I make my way up the steps, adrenaline pumping, and concentrating on pieing the corner at the top. Excuse the jargon, but pieing is basically the right way to round a corner to increase the chance of you getting the drop on someone. My CQB instructor would probably crucify for oversimplifying it that much, but you get the idea. I stop a few stairs shy of the corner, 
take a breath, then proceed the rest of the way up. The hallway at the top was pitch black, and after successfully clearing the top corner, we make our way down the hallway, clearing rooms. We weren't even at the final room of the hallway yet when we realized that there was someone inside of it. Once all the others were cleared, we had them cornered. But once we stacked up on the room and heard someone talking inside, we realized we were dealing with a kid. A kid just talking to themselves like they were playing with toys or something. Still cautious, I knocked on the door and announced that we were the police, then said something like, I don't think you're supposed to be in this house, come out. I made sure not to sound too aggressive or anything, last thing I wanted was to scare them, and if they had gotten in through an upstairs window, there's a chance they'd try to flee out of it, get themselves hurt, and you get the idea. So like I said, I called out to the kid, but when they replied saying, I'll be out in a minute, something sounded slightly off about the kid's voice. They sounded older. I couldn't tell by how much, but like I mentioned already, something just wasn't right. I told the kid I was going to enter the room and with my weapon pulled close into my torso, I reached for the doorknob and it was a push-in door, loose and light on the frames too, and I remember just how slowly pushing it open and stepping back to assess who was in there. It was not a kid. It was a grown man, but with a kid's voice, who turns and says like, hey, I said I'll be out in a minute. I didn't even really know how to accurately describe it either. Like it actually sounded kind of genuine, not a put on, but like it could have been a medical condition or something. But that wasn't even the craziest thing about this guy. From what I could tell, the guy had broken in, stripped down to his undies, then appeared to be shaving in this lady's vanity table or something. Only he wasn't shaving any hair off, he was shaving his skin off. I have this really clear memory of how white the vanity was and how almost luminous red this guy's blood was in comparison. And Jesus Christ, there was so much of it too. Like they say facial wounds bleed the most. I watch a bunch of MMA and that's how those guys end up all bloody from fairly small cuts. Then imagine maybe a hundred of them all over a guy's face. It was carnage. I pushed over to the right hand side of the door giving the other officers room to cover, and that's when one of my guys is like, Whoa, stop. What are you thinking, buddy? The guy turned to him, and his face is just a freaking mess. And he says in his little kid voice, This isn't my face. This isn't me. By some miracle, we managed to take the guy in without a single struggle, although we did have to put on our blue surgical gloves because of all the blood, and I still think I got some on me. We got him down to lock up, got the EMTs to him, then breathalyzed him, but it all came back clean. Chief then wanted his blood to test for narcotics and the guy reacted exactly like a kid would, non-violent, just all squeamish and whiny. Some lady EMT had to talk him up like a mommy and I'm not kidding when I say he literally said owie when the needle went in. Not long after, he went under psych eval and the doc was with him for about 10 minutes before he emerged from the interview room saying the dude had severe learning difficulties and would soon be under the custody of State Psychiatric Hospital. After that, the guy was out of our hands and the last I heard he was fast tracked for indefinite detention and being pumped full of just about every psych med you can imagine. Everyone who was on that call said it was the worst thing they'd ever seen on the job Everything about it was just awful, from the neglect that poor disabled guy suffered to what he ended up doing to himself. No other call has ever even gotten close to it, and God willing, they'll stay that way for the rest of my career. I've worked as a commercial logger for most of my life and it's taken me to some pretty remote places here in Canada. I don't have much of a family either since I grew up in foster care so it's always suited me to work over the holidays. I don't say that for sympathy or anything, you make crazy money working those times of year so I was always pretty handsomely compensated for time that would otherwise be spent alone. For nine years straight, working the holidays became a godsend 
and it got to the point where I'd actually come to look forward to it. And then came one year where what was once all peaceful and quiet became something I grew to fear. This was winter of 2009, and I had already worked Christmas, so I was the natural choice to work New Year's too. I was asked, and obviously I accepted, so it would just be me and this other guy, Jerry, taking care of the logging camp over New Year's. Even better, it was overtime rates to do no work, so we were getting paid just to sit around and drink for like 24 hours. It seemed like the deal of a lifetime to be honest, and that couldn't have been further from the truth. Because on New Year's Eve, right when me and Jerry were nice and toasty from a few bottles of Molson, some really weird stuff started to happen. The first thing happened when I discovered my phone charging cable was busted. Luckily, I had another in the form of my car charger, which I could just unhook then bring inside, so I throw on a jacket and head outside to my truck to get it. But as I'm heading back inside, I see Jerry running through the darkness towards the woods. A little side note here, and in contrast to what other people have said, the person I saw running into the trees was 100% Jerry. Same clothes, same movements. Heck, he even looked back at me when I called out his name, and it was Jerry's face looking back at me. So obviously, I'm real confused at what he's doing, and given that he seems panicked by something, I follow him to see if he's okay. That's when I see something dark staining the snow behind him, something that I soon discovered was blood. As you can imagine, this sent me into a panic. The last time I had spoken to Jerry was literally a minute or two before, when I told him that I was going out to my truck to grab the spare charging cable. So, the question of how he'd managed to get himself hurt that bad in like seconds was something that was equally scary and confusing. I took off after him, calling out his name as I went, but for some reason, Jerry wouldn't stop running. One time he looked back at me with his look of fear, like he figured I was chasing him or something. So again, I'm screaming, yo Jerry, it's me buddy, stop. But still, Jerry kept on pushing forward, dodging trees and leaving a blood trail the whole way. And it was quite a lot of blood too, which obviously had me even more worried because he needed treatment and it was obvious he needed it fast. Then, as I'm chasing Jerry, I thought I heard something running through the snow, just over a rise about 50 yards to our right. My first thought is something like, oh god, that's the person who hurt Jerry. So I just stopped dead, finding myself caught at a kind of crossroads. Either I could carry on chasing Jerry and face being intercepted by the person who cut him or shot him or whatever, or... I could run back to the cabins and get help. Besides, there's no catching up with him, not at the speeds I was getting, always spent on the heavier side, so you know how that goes, and I definitely wouldn't have been able to carry on dragging him back to the cabins. I expend the very last of my stamina heading back to the cabins, like I was almost ready to puke by the time I got to the entrance. I just about fell inside, pushing myself on to find my phone so I could contact emergency services. But then, as I stumbled down one of the hallways, someone steps out from one of the rooms, blocking my path. It was Jerry. He seemed a little confused by the state I was in, but other than that, he seemed fine, and before I could ask how in God's name had he gotten back before me, why he wasn't bleeding, or any of the other hundred questions I had, he says, Uh, are you okay, man? I was freaking out and I think I just about put the fear of God in him when I shouted back something like, Dude, am I okay? I'm fixing to call the paramedics out here for you. He replies exactly with, Why? And after that, I got to explaining everything I'd just seen. And as you can probably guess, Jerry just looked at me like I was crazy for the whole time I was talking, and when I was done, he actually looked a little freaked out himself. The way he spoke to me afterwards wasn't, all that patronizing, but I could tell he thought I was having some kind of manic episode or something. He responds, well, whoever that was, it couldn't have been me. Might have looked to make me, but it wasn't me. And all I could think to do was take him outside and show him the blood trails, which were still plain to be seen in the snow. Now when we run back inside and call 911, 
making sure to use the Wi-Fi connection so we get a relatively stable connection. And once things started to calm down a little, me and Jerry got to speculating over who the guy could have been and, more specifically, what could have happened for him to get all cut up. Jerry was about 20 years older than me, definitely more level-headed, and after mulling it over for a minute or two, he came up with a pretty definitive answer. He figured the guy had been trying to steal one of our saws, maybe even just the blade, and had cut his hand or arm in the process. Then the whole him looking like Jerry thing could have just been pure coincidence. Older guy, light-colored ski jacket, and in the low light of dusk too, it was an easy mistake to make. After that, only thing left was to wonder what our potential thief's fate would be. I mean, he'd been bleeding pretty bad from the look of the blood trails, and as much as he might have been trying to screw us over, we didn't want anyone to lose their life out there in the cold. Anyway, midnight came and went, and we celebrated the New Year's with a few more bottles of Molson. Then, as we're flicking through TV channels, talking amongst ourselves, I hear this faint noise over the sound of the TV. Jerry heard it too, only he was the one to actually say it. Is that your truck alarm? I thought we both might have been mistaken and that the noise was on the TV, but then Jerry mutes the TV and boom, it is my truck alarm. We kept two rifles in the cabins in case of an animal attack and never once in my career had I needed to go for the gun cabinet. But the second I heard that alarm clearly, I ran for the cabinet's keys. Jerry might have insisted on being his rational self, but that was the moment I knew something weird was going on. I loaded the rifle, shouting for Jerry to wait until I had it ready before going outside. Then, with me at the lead, we walked out of the cabin, me with the hunting rifle and Jerry with a flashlight. My truck's lights were flashing, so Jerry knew where to point the flashlight right away. I'm just trying to aim where Jerry's pointing, keeping an eye out for whoever had been messing with my truck, but there was no one to be seen. Jerry then starts calling out into the darkness, saying stuff like, Hey, better come out now. We're armed. But again, no one made a sound and no one showed themselves. After a few moments of nothing but a blaring alarm, I hear Jerry say, I think it was just a deer or something? I have no idea at the time. I just remember hoping it was a deer as I slowly reached for my keys and praying it was just a deer when I realized the flashing lights were messing with my natural night vision. If anyone wanted to reach out of the darkness and grab for me, or the rifle, I'd have been none the wiser till it was too late. Once the alarm was off, we made sure to call out a few more times before going back inside. I remember Jerry saying something like, If you're hurt out there, we can help you. I figured that might be the right angle, so I followed up by saying, Hey, we don't care what you're up to no good, we just... Listen, there's no need for anyone to get hurt over it. Right after, I got this weird sensation. Like how weird did it look if we were just out there talking to no one? But at the same time, we knew someone was out there. I decided not to drink anymore after that, and we had the following day off, but... I intended to use the daylight to find out just what in God's name was going on. But even with the beer I'd already drank, it wasn't easy drifting off to sleep, and I kept the rifle next to my bed the whole time. The next morning my first thought was to go follow the blood trail, since I'd have a much better view on account of the daylight. I followed them for about a mile, still a fairly bright red on account of being preserved by the cold and they definitely started to loop back around in the direction of the cabins. But at some point, they just sort of stopped. I figured the person might have stemmed the bleeding, maybe got a tourniquet on their wound or something like that, and thankfully there was still boot prints in the snow to follow, so I was able to confirm that the wounded person had indeed looped back around to the logging cabin. After following the prints, I determined that the person had come back to try and break into my truck, this obviously set the alarm off, and the prince leading away from the truck must have been when we scared the guy off. Seemed like nothing more than a case of attempted theft, and the only scares we'd gotten had come out of our beer bottles. But then Jerry noted something that sent all our theories into chaos. Just picture it. Just when we thought we'd worked out what had happened, 
Jerry is looking at one of the boot prints with this focused look on his face. I asked him if he's coming back inside as I was fixing to make some bacon for breakfast, but instead of replying to me, he started doing something really, really weird. He stood on one leg, took off his right boot, and then started to study the pattern of the sole. I knew exactly what this implied, and he didn't need to tell me why he suddenly turned as pale as the snow around us. The pattern in the boot prints in the snow was exactly the same as those on Jerry's boots, like 100% identical. Again, it's not out of the question that he just had the same make and model of boot as Jerry, who, by his own admission, had picked a sort of middle-of-the-road, cheap and cheerful pair. But the same clothes, same face, same boots, all at once, I'm sure you can agree that makes for one heck of a coincidence. But how even bring that up with Jerry? How could I even entertain such a bizarre idea with someone dead set on being incredibly rational? Well, the answer is to that, I didn't. January 2nd saw the first few returning employees, and once there were other people to talk to, the story went right back to some idiot hurt themselves trying to rob us, and then they tried to steal my truck. I dropped the whole thing about the guy being Jerry's doppelganger, both in looks and clothes. I mean, would you want to be that guy walking around talking crazy, having everyone think you're a few logs short of a cord? I think that would have been the second fastest way to ensure my contract wasn't renewed, second only to punching my crew chief in the face. And besides, I didn't even trust myself regarding what I'd seen. Like I was convinced that I had just maybe drank too much or something, even though I had exactly one and a half bottles at the time of the incident. So, I just tried to forget about it, finished up my three months, then signed up to posting elsewhere come the start of the next logging season. Almost ten years have gone by since that New Year's Eve, and you'd think that time would be the best thing to have something like that settle, but it hasn't, and even all these years later, I'm still left with the question of, can everything that happened that night be explained in a simple and logical way, or was there something else going on, something that only someone much smarter than myself could possibly explain? I lost my Uncle Jack recently. Technically, his name was Great Uncle John, but for some reason, we all just called him Uncle Jack. Yet this unusual name switch was probably the least unusual thing about him. Uncle Jack was obsessed with old western films and was once arrested for trying to buy a six-shooter from an undercover policeman. He didn't end up doing any time for it and just got away with a slap on the wrist and lifetime firearms bans. But till the end of his days, he acted like the whole thing made him a bona fide outlaw. And in a way, I suppose it did. Uncle Jack was also half deaf and terrified of the dentist. He had dentures by the time I really got to know him, but my parents mentioned him having a terrible time with his teeth, right up until the day the hangers on were extracted and replaced. But for years and years, I had no idea that his deafness and his odontophobia were inextricably linked. It was only at a New Year's Eve shindig a few years ago that I finally plucked up the courage to ask him about his ailments, and although I don't regret asking him, his answer was nothing short of horrifying. Uncle Jack was born in 1937, so he was two years old when World War II kicked off. And given that he lived in Coventry, a place that was targeted by German bombers, he actually lived through all the horrifying air raid siren running to the shelter stuff that we call the Blitz. Apparently one night the warnings were so late that not all of his family got out of the house before the bombs fell, and three-year-old Ralph was being cradled by his mum, my great-grandmother, under the kitchen table when a bomb completely demolished the house next door. And by some miracle, both Uncle Jack and his mum survived the hit, but both suffered from damaged hearing for the rest of their lives. Definitely a crazy story, but then the conversation wandered onto why he hated the dentist so much. He said that even though he was only three and a half years old, he had this one particular memory of the bombings burned into his brain. I use that word burned very deliberately, by the way, because it involved German firebombs. I'm not sure if they specifically use firebombs in Coventry, but 
One raid apparently started this huge fire, and when it was over, my ancestors had to leg it through the streets to keep from burning to death. The fire created such intense heat that people running out of the burning house got stuck in the molten asphalt on the streets and burned to death, and other survivors said the smell of burning people haunted them for a long time after, and that's where the dentist comes into it. My Uncle Jack said the first time he ever got a tooth drilled, the smell that came off of it brought all these memories of the Blitz come flooding back. I suppose it was the smell of burning bones that really did it. And then, since whatever your teeth are made of is similar, the smell was close enough to trigger all those bad memories. He said he started making all these noises since he couldn't talk with all the cotton in his cheeks, and when the dentist backed off, he said he ran out of the surgery and ran all the way home. I think he was only really comfortable telling me those things because we were livid, because if anyone in the family knew about it, they certainly hadn't seen fit to tell me. All my life I thought Uncle Jack was just a bit weird, but to think it was all because his neighborhood had been bombed, repeatedly, when he was just a little baby, and I honestly can't think of anything more horrifying than that. He'd experience things in his life that probably make the worst day of my life look like a walk in the park. And aside from his strange aversion to the dentist and his unhealthy obsession with westerns, I think he got away with minimal trauma. I suppose that's why they call them the greatest generation. So rest in peace, Uncle Jack. You will be missed. So back when I was in high school, I used to be huge into something we called urbex. Apologies in advance if you know all this, but urbex is short for urban exploration and is an umbrella term for a bunch of different stuff you do in abandoned and derelict buildings. One time a friend and I decided it would be a good idea to explore a farmstead that hadn't been in use for years. We'd been exploring buildings downtown for years, so the idea of getting into the sticks to get some urbex in seemed pretty cool. My only excuse in this case was that it was New Year's Day, and on that day, almost everything in our town used to shut down for a day. If we hadn't been so freaking bored, none of this would have happened in the first place. Anyway, the farmstead was accessible by a long gravel road that brought you to a cluster of dilapidated buildings across a central barn. We parked at the end of the gravel road near the turnoff to the main road so we could walk around the property and just pull out quickly later. Then as we got out of the car, we saw just how creepy this place really looked. But not just that, we noticed how big the place was too. I figured it'd make for a good derp, what we call abandoned places, and in a way, it was. I measured that by the potential of seeing the kind of stuff that your average person just doesn't see. Some cool stuff, some creepy stuff. A good example on the farm would be finding the place where they used, <clears throat> to make baby cows only without the presence of a bull, if you know what I'm saying. you think it'd be more scientific, but no, literal turkey basters, dude. And creepy slash gross is definitely the worst combination to stumble across. Anyway, after that little discovery, we were grossed out, but not exactly put off exploring the place. Not until we heard the sound of a pig squealing somewhere nearby. We just froze when we heard it, giving each other a look as if to be like, uh oh. I had driven by the place like three times in the past week and at no point had I seen any people, cars, or trucks anywhere. Everything was either boarded up or falling apart. There were weeds growing everywhere. It was the picture-perfect derp. So, how in God's name was it occupied? Now, quick explanation, we know our trespassing law pretty well and you're basically entitled to one, sorry I got lost before you can actually be charged. Getting lost isn't a crime, but repeatedly and maliciously trespassing is, so it's not like we were all that worried about getting in trouble with the law, or like scaring some armed security guard into turning that one particular derp into our last. In order to avoid this, our first line of defense, if you can call it that, is simply to announce our presence. If someone knows we're here, they're less likely to draw on us, so... We start calling out made-up stuff on the fly, like, Hello? Is this Carson Construction? We're here for the pickup. 
Just random stuff like that. Anything to make someone think that there just been an honest mistake. But there's nothing. No one calls back. There's just silence, interrupted only by another squeal of the pig. My buddy's just like, oh, let's just leave, dude. Whatever this is, it's not worth it. But my dumb self gets all sentimental over the pig, thinking that someone may have abandoned it there. I'm not the pig whisperer or whatever, but its cries didn't sound very chipper, and I'd hate to think that I'd had the chance to intervene, only to nope out out of self-preservation. I'm not some PETA type person or anything like that, but I'm not a heartless idiot either, so I insisted we at least go check on the pig, just in case it needed freeing or whatever. And as I told my buddy, worst thing that had happened was we'd get told to get lost. The best thing was we'd have a brand new pet pig. So, we get to work trying to find the farm's pig pen or barn or wherever the pig was. The whole farm fell dead silent again as we began looking for the pig, and we had to shout out stuff like, Here, piggy, piggy, piggy. It was kind of funny. This prompted another squeal from the pig, a more excited one this time, and that's pretty much convinced me that the poor guy or girl had just been abandoned, and hearing a human's voice gave them hope. I know, this is all just in my head, pure childish naivety on my part, and if I had known back then what I know right now, I would have gotten out of there in a hot minute. But we were blissfully ignorant, and so we carried on looking. Eventually, we found a building that looked a lot more like an old school crematorium than a barn or a pig pen. It was made almost entirely of red brick, with these big old cast iron doors that only had a hint of rust to them, despite looking like a hundred years old. We knew the pig was in there because we could hear it snuffling around and rustling a bunch of hay or whatever it was using to sleep on. We called out to it once again, but the squeal wasn't so loud that time. It was more like a few quiet grunts because it knew we were close. The only question then was how to break into the building. There was no getting into the main doors as they were bolted and chained shut. There was a chance we might be able to find some roof access, but that would involve a pretty hefty climb. But then we noticed what appeared to be like a side vent, nothing more than a small hole in the brick with an iron grate fixed in, but it'd be enough for us to spy through to get a clue of how to gain entry. I remember walking over to it, kneeling, then peering into the dimly lit interior, then out of nowhere, the sight of an eye suddenly appearing in front of me had me just about jumping out of my skin. My buddy burst out laughing, dunking on me for getting spooked by a barn animal, which I suppose he was well within his right to do. But then the more I looked at the eye and the more it looked back at me, the more I realized that there was something off about it. I'm not exactly a vet, so it wasn't exactly obvious what the wrong thing was at first. Not until we heard something else coming through that little metal grate. My buddy, still amused from seeing me spooked, comes over to be like, Hey there, little piggy. We're going to get you out of there. What's your name, little guy? There was some more excited snuffling from the other side of the grate. Then I heard something that honestly made my blood run cold. I know that's a huge cliche, but I can't think of a better way to describe it. The thing that made fear shoot through me was hearing a human voice on the other side of the grate. A human voice that said, Help me. I swear, when I first heard it, I thought it was just my buddy playing a prank. But when I looked back at him, I swear I could literally see the color draining from his face. I didn't even get the question. I just said, like, did... And he just shook his head in reply. Then, as I looked back at the grate, the last thing I see before we took off running was a finger sliding through one of the small gaps. Like I said, we just bolted galloping back towards the car as fast as our legs could carry us. I had my phone out as soon as I was in the passenger seat, and I had to stick a finger in my ear just to hear the dispatcher because my buddy was gunning his engine so hard. I told her everything, even the whole trespassing thing, saying we were urbexers who knew that they were breaking the law but still wanted to do what was right. Like, I was pretty confident we wouldn't be charged with anything if we were helping free a kidnap victim or whatever was going on with that poor guy back there. Once we were safely back home, we told everyone we could what we'd seen, 
and the only comfort was that we'd done a good thing and maybe help rescue the guy. All we had to do was wait to hear back from the cops or whatever. Heck, I figured I might see it in the news soon anyways. The cops called back the day after next and for the first time ever, I was actually pleased to hear from the police. But boy was I wrong to be because the little chit chat me and the local sheriff arranged turned out to be anything but the hero's congratulation I thought I was in for. When he walked into my parents' house, he asked my mom and dad if he could talk to me alone and he did it with a stern look on his face that gave away that it wouldn't be the talk I was expecting. Then, he basically sat me down and told me if I ever filed a false report like that again, he'd personally make sure I spent the night in jail. I was 19 by that time, so he didn't just mean kitty lockup, he meant legit adult county jail. So obviously, that threat scared me quite a bit, but more importantly, I wasn't lying. The sheriff said that two of his deputies had paid a visit to the farm less than an hour after I'd called 911. They'd found the building I'd told them about, the old brick one with the cast iron doors. They found the doors open and the inside completely deserted. When he'd finished giving me the little lecture on filing false police reports, I started begging him to believe me. I swore on my mom that every word I told the dispatcher was the truth and that I wasn't dumb or immature enough to just make something like that up. I told him I wished I hadn't found that guy there, and that the whole pig thing, his squeals, I'd been hearing them in my nightmares for like two nights in a row. That was the closest I'd come to crying since breaking up with my high school girlfriend junior year. The frustration was like nothing I'd ever felt before or since. It's one thing to be accused of lying, it's another thing when a guy's entire life might be at stake. Again, I begged him to believe me, and I think for a second my words actually got through to him a little. I asked him to swear that his deputies hadn't found any signs of human habitation, and that's when he broke eye contact. He sighed, then looked back and told me that there had been signs that livestock had been kept there in the recent past, but nothing more than that. Then, as he got up to leave, he said something like, if you saw anything out there, and I highly doubt you did, you didn't see nothing but an animal. And I almost lost it. I told him both myself and my buddy had heard the guy speak, how it was 100% a man's voice, and that we hadn't been mistaken. As he was walking, I called him out on it, asked him just what in God's name I'd seen. You saw a pig, son, he said. He didn't see nothing but a pig. On New Year's Eve of 2018, Bart and Danielle Yancey of Vestavia Hills, Alabama received a rather unexpected guest at their quiet suburban home. They'd enjoyed a warm, fun-filled holiday season, packed with visits to relatives, hearty meals, and heartfelt gifts. It had been joyous, but it had been exhausting and the advent of a new year brought the Yanceys a chance to rest and recuperate. But little did they know that, for them, 2019 would begin with a mysterious and terrifying encounter. In the final few hours before the couple planned to sleep, Bart walked out front to take out the trash. Just as he was about to return inside, Bart caught a glimpse of a shadow in the garage. It appeared to be a person trespassing on their property, yet when Bart managed to get a good glimpse of him, he roared out in a mix of rage and fear. You see, this wasn't your average case of trespassing. The man in question was completely nude, save for a mask of former President Ronald Reagan. By his own admission, Bart was terrified to see a naked masked man sneaking onto his property. But this was his family home, a place of sanctuary and protection, a place where the love of his life laid her head at night. As such, Bart's defensive instincts completely overshadowed any desire for self-preservation, and he violently shouted at the man while advancing aggressively. Thankfully, the man ran off when spotted by Danielle's husband, and 911 was contacted shortly afterward. However, it was clearly a very close call, 
and footage of the man caught on their home security video was later posted on Facebook as a warning to others, stating, I know a lot of people are laughing about it and honestly, I got a chuckle from it later, but at the same time, it's very concerning, Danielle Yancey later said. I don't know what he was planning on doing, and if it wasn't for my husband spotting him, there's no telling what he could have gotten away with. Eustavia Hills police responded to the scene but weren't able to locate or apprehend the creeper. It was so cold outside, Danielle Yancey added. Police said he wouldn't last long outside with no clothes on. They said he probably had someone waiting for him in a car close by or that he might even have been a neighbor. That last idea really creeped me out. Danielle also mentioned that multiple theories have been discussed, including more innocuous pretexts such as a dare a lost bet, or perhaps a teenage New Year's Eve party gone out of control. He could have been messed up on drugs or alcohol, and in that mindset, you don't know what he might do to someone else, Bart Yancey said. He could have potentially hurt us, or we could have hurt him. Even if it was a prank, it could have become very scary and dangerous quickly. In the days that followed, Vestavia Hills police publicly stated that they'd received another call, this one at about 11 p.m., regarding another naked person prowling through the neighborhood in the direction of Vestavia Hills Baptist Church. Given that it was a repeated incident, they rushed to the scene, but the creeper was unable to be found. In the aftermath, the Yancey family stated that they simply want their neighbors and community to be aware and safe, in the hopes that any threat the trespasser poses can be adequately countered. I hope he never does it again, because next time... Someone might not be as lucky as us, she said. Maybe we spooked him off enough to go to another house and not do it again, but after I heard he did it the next time, I don't think we've heard the last of him. It's clear that if it wasn't for the intervention of Bart Yancey, his wife Danielle might have been in the gravest of danger. As we previously speculated, there's a chance that the creeper only targeted the Yancey home because he believed Danielle was alone and what actually saved her was the presence of her much larger, much stronger husband, who surprised the creeper so badly that he simply fled the scene. Realistically, women can't be around a male bodyguard 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and while freedom and independence remain just as important as safety and well-being, this remains a continual problem for females everywhere. The world will never truly be rid of evil. Malevolence will always exist. Therefore, women must afford themselves extra protection, and not necessarily in the form of weapons or gadgets. If Danielle's creeper had gotten his way, there's a big chance he'd have ambushed her before she had a chance to aim a pistol or activate an alarm. Therefore, one of the only practical methods of self-defense would be some kind of grappling-based martial art, such as judo or sambo. Don't worry, guys. I'm not about to go all Joe Rogan on you by waxing lyrical about the benefits of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but maybe in 2022, more women should be arming themselves with practical self-defense skills, allowing them to terrify those who seek to terrify them in return. Happy New Year's, friends, and please, be safe. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember... Wait, is that something Bernie?